Um, good morning, late morning, everybody. My name is Amy Miller. I am um, a nurse practitioner here at Sarasota Memorial Healthcare System. I work with the Cancer Institute. Uh, my primary focus is lung cancer screening, uh, prevention, early detection. And today uh, we are here to welcome our expert panel uh, presenters um, to our lung cancer research, uh, recent advancements and future opportunities panel discussion. So um, we're bringing this to you this month because November is National Lung Cancer Awareness Month. And um, we just really want to um, help the Sarasota community bring some more awareness about the updates regarding um, lung cancer and its treatment. Um, so today we have our panel experts here. So really feel free to uh, submit your questions via Facebook. We will uh, be bringing them forward and, and bringing them to the presenters. And then to anybody in the, um, in the audience is welcome to also ask our experts questions as well. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to let them introduce themselves, and then we'll get started with some questions. Hi, I'm Dr. Larry Silverman. I'm a radiation oncologist with 21st Century Oncology. My name is Dr. Kevin Kohler. I'm a medical oncologist with Florida Cancer Maps in downtown Sarasota. Um, and I work with these guys frequently. My name is Joe Seaman. I'm one of the pulmonologists in the area that's passionate about lung cancer. Good morning. My name is Dr. Paul Chomiak. I'm the director of thoracic surgical oncology here at the uh, Sarasota Memorial Cancer Center. Okay, great. So um, we're just going to go ahead and get started. And again, as you would like to, please submit your questions via Facebook. We're going to go ahead and start with some basic questions. I'm going to focus this one to Dr. Seaman. So one of the questions that they often get is, how, how would I know if I have lung cancer? So unfortunately, a lot of folks don't know they have lung cancer. And uh, somewhere between 20 and 40% of people may have no symptoms. So that's why we try to focus on high risk groups for lung cancer screening to identify individuals who may um, have a higher risk than average and we focus on lung cancer screening for that purpose. Um, but we also have to be aware and, and encourage people to bring unusual or brain symptoms to their provider um, so that we can investigate further. And what are those symptoms? Like lung cancer? You're gonna have to project hard. Okay. Um, so some of the vague symptoms that folks may have is cough, congestion, nonspecific fatigue, maybe some weight loss. Um, and that's the problem with lung cancer. Sometimes the symptoms are so vague that folks oftentimes just forget about them or explain them away for, for other reasons before they actually come to medical attention. So can you talk a little bit more about the screening test for lung cancer? Sure. So uh, as I mentioned before, there are high risk groups for lung cancer. Um, the one that comes up the most is age and smoking history. And that's why we focus our screening efforts on that group of patients, because those are the ones that uh, it tends to benefit the most. Unfortunately, it still misses 10 to 20% of people who are lifelong non-smokers who still go on to get lung cancer. But right now, that's our only uh, identified um, screening program. We do recognize that there are some upcoming technologies that, that may show some promise that include blood tests for certain proteins and or markers uh, that could uh, allow for some better lung cancer screening. Right, and is Sarasota Memorial um, participating in any research regarding that? So we're very fortunate to have a, a well-developed lung cancer screening program. Uh, we've identified several lung cancers in early stage uh, and have offered them a surgical cure. Um, and we also are involved in several different research programs looking at some of these blood tests uh, to help develop them and look at them in the future. And what would be your um, number one recommendation to help reduce risk of lung cancer? So some things that folks can do is obviously quit smoking if they are a smoker. Um, that's the biggest identifiable risk factor. Um, there are some you know, literature that shows that exercise and uh, taking care of yourself also helps to reduce uh, lung cancer risk. But I'm not offering any other suggestions from the other panelists. Um, so we pass the mic to Dr. Chomiak. Um, so when somebody is diagnosed with lung cancer, um, just talk a little bit about sort of what the first step is. You know, like why why would you be able to or wouldn't you be able to just to surgically remove um, a, a tumor or a nodule? Great question. Um, what we see in our country 
is about 80% of patients that are diagnosed with lung cancer are already advanced stage, meaning that the cancer has spread from the location in the lung, in the lung to regional lymph nodes or perhaps elsewhere in the body. And as Dr. Seen alluded to, the problem is we're all creatures of denial. So we don't have any obvious symptoms to say, stop, you have lung cancer, go see a doctor. So a lot of the symptoms you have are, can be confused with a cold, can be confused with a bronchitis, or you may not have any symptoms at all. We're hoping with screening that we can actually change that ratio. And we've seen great examples of this in the fields of breast cancer, in the fields of colon cancer and prostate, where by screening, you can actually identify earlier stage patients. We know with 50 years worth of scientific data that if somebody has an early stage lung cancer and they are strong enough to tolerate surgery, surgical removal of the cancer as well as the regional lymph nodes provides the best opportunity for long-term cure. So we've got to find those patients, but because of what I shared with you, the majority of them currently are more advanced, we have to stage those patients. And what that means is often enough patients will come to me, I have lung cancer, just cut it out, just get it out of me, I want it out of me. Well, back in the 1970s when there weren't many options in the early 80s, that's what we did. And we found for the majority of those patients, because they were advanced, they really didn't see the benefit of so what's very prudent is to take these patients, put them through certain tests. You may hear a test like a PET scan or an MRI of the brain or perhaps some blood work, and then do some additional testing to look to see, is there any evidence that the cancer cells have spread into the lymph nodes within the center of the chest or elsewhere? And once we complete those staging procedures, which may require a surgical procedure, a minimal invasive surgical procedure to confirm the stage, once we identify the correct stage one or stage two patient, then we can offer them surgery for curative Okay, thank you. Um, so maybe pass it down to Dr. Silverman. And is there ever a time that um, rate, uh, radiation would be a preferred method of treatment over surgery? So radiation and surgery are quite similar in that they're local therapies and uh, based upon stage surgery has indications and when the stage becomes a little more advanced we move more to the traditional types of radiation but there's also for some early stage newer technology called stereotactic line grade therapy that we're using for patients who either aren't very good candidates for surgery because of other medical issues or uh, just don't want surgery so um, Typically, it's stage dependent, it's patient dependent whether uh, they are fit for surgery, and it's also um, the psychology of the patient too, of whether they feel mentally they can handle the surgery. So um, it is a good alternative in certain instances, and then as the stage gets more advanced, it's preferred over surgery more in that setting. Okay, thank you. Um, what, what is the difference between cyber knife and radiotactic? So stereotactic body radiotherapy is a general term which uh, is inclusive of many different type of machines. Cyber knife is one of the machines. There's about five or six uh, machine companies that make machines that can utilize this technology. So the cyber knife machine is a machine that can only do that, but the other vendors, such as Barry and Electa, there's different manufacturers, make machines that can not only do the higher technology such as that, but also generalized treatment. So that's that's really the difference. Um, Stereotactic body rate therapy is a way for us to deliver very high doses of radiation uh, with accuracy and precision, and up until about 10, 12 years ago, we weren't able to track tumors with the breathing cycle. Now, through other technologies that allow us to do that, uh, we know that when we give these high doses, we are not missing the tumors. That was the big issue. Or radiating areas that don't need to be radiated. Right, so it allows us to uh, give these high doses, know we're hitting the tumor, and really giving very minimal, if any, radiation to the surrounding structures. 
Um, so maybe pass it to Dr. Kohler. And actually, I'll just stop for a minute and just remind everybody that you know, if you're watching via Facebook and you want to submit a question, please do so. We'll bring those questions up front. Is there anybody in the audience that has a question for the panel at this moment? I have a question. Um, I have stage four lung cancer and radiation was never offered to me. That was off the table in the seventh case. So radiation can be used in different settings. One for curative intent, uh, which means that the cancer has to be anywhere from stage one to three, localized to the one chest. To Once it got, goes beyond that, it becomes stage four, then a more whole body systemic, we call it, treatment is really indicated. And in situations where we have stage four, the main indication for radiation becomes what we call palliation. If the cancer is in an area causing a problem, the health dependence Nowadays, with newer drugs, really keeping people alive much longer, sometimes we're even giving radiation in situations where the patient really doesn't have any issues, but there could be one, two, maybe a couple areas that aren't being controlled by the whole body in care of your system very much. So there's kind of a shift in, in the feeling now given um, these new therapies, targeted agents, and it's very contextual whether or not you would get radiation when you have advanced disease, like Dr. Silverman was saying. And there's what we're finding as time goes on, this is all kind of breaking news. It's all developing, but there's a lot of newer phase trials that's looking at short courses of radiation in different parts of the body, even when people develop stage four disease or diagnosis, and that seems to be improving survival. A big improvement. It's sort of a surprising finding for everybody as well. So it's not inappropriate to not be offered radiation at diagnosis. It kind of depends on the context of everything. Well, while we have the microphone, why don't um, you kind of go a little bit further and sort of your area um, and really, you know, maybe start by talking about um, sort of how things have changed for lung cancer and treatment over the last five years or so. Yeah, so as a medical oncologist, what we typically, what we traditionally did was we were the guys who gave out chemotherapy and systemic treatments. And in the last like um, five years in lung cancer in particular, there's been a lot of development, um, primarily in two different fields. One has been in immunotherapies, and the other one has been in targeted agents. Um, so the more we learn about lung cancer, the better we get at treating it. Um, so to start with the target agents, what we do nowadays whenever someone gets a new diagnosis is we look at their genetics of the disease. Um, and we're often looking at things we don't understand yet, but there's a certain amount of mutations that we can find that we can actually treat with a certain type of drug. Um, so for example, you might, if you read about this when you have a loved one or something, something like this, you could find mutations in genes like EGFR or ALF or ROS1. Um, and we use newer platforms to figure that out, both sampling the tumor tissue as well as blood tests. So blood tests, we can actually find circulating tumor DNA and find that someone might have one of these, what we call actionable mutations. And that's probably roughly about 10 to 12% of all new patients with metastatic lung cancer. And the interesting thing about folks who have what we call driver mutation disease is that they tend to be the folks who you would never suspect would ever have lung cancer. They tend to be younger, they tend to be women, they tend to have never smoked. So we're finding more and more about that as time moves on. And those drugs just continue to get better. And now there's almost um, so much redundancy on the market with some of them, it becomes a difficult choice on what we choose. So that's been a very big development in treatment. Um, so everyone who has stage four lung cancer has to be molecular profile. You have to have the genetics done, whether that's the tissue itself or that's a blood test. And there's really only a handful of companies who are doing that really well right now. Um, the other big development that's been made in like the last three to five years has been with immunotherapies, which you've probably seen advertisements on TV for. Um, if you watch like the 6.30 news, like every other commercials for a pharma company. Um, so Keytruda is on there. Uh, usually Opdivo is on there. Those are two of the most common ones that we use. Um, and essentially, uh, with the immunotherapies, these type of immunotherapies are called checkpoint inhibitors. They're infusions, so they're still IVs, but they're very different from chemotherapy. They work by disinhibiting the immune system. So a big part of cancer, 
the, the reason why it propagates is it, it evades the immune response. And there's a fraction of people who we know would respond really well if we can just get that immune system kind of over the fence to fight the cancer. Um, and we can predict that nowadays with, with what we call bio biomarkers. So predictive biomarkers we always order now as well to see if someone can respond to just immunotherapy by itself. Um, and so there's always a portion of people who can live long term on immunotherapies. Um, and some of these trials have gone up five years now, and there's still about 20% of people alive on these drugs living good quality lives. I have patients like this myself. Um, so that's been a big um, improvement. And then more recently, there's been a lot of trials experimenting with chemotherapy in addition to immunotherapies. So kind of giving them all at once. A lot of us were skeptical about these trials when they were being designed, and then they've, they've since been reported to not just be positive, but to be remarkably positive. So it's working really quite well for a lot of people. So you know, the survival for someone with advanced lung cancer in 2018 is completely different than what it was even three years ago. Um, the only thing, the other thing I'd add is stage three disease. Um, so stage three disease is when you have lymph nodes here in the chest involved, but nowhere else. And typically that was a very controversial area, and it still is to some degree whether or not you offer surgery, but usually it was chemo radiation that we offered. And for about 20, 25 years, that didn't change a whole lot. Um, and then just recently, we've actually increased the amount of cure rates for stage three disease as well, because we follow traditional chemo radiation with a year of immunotherapy. Um, and that was just, uh, that's called the Pacific trial, that was just updated this past September and increased cure rates by about 20%. So there's been a lot of improvements. Thank you. Again, does anybody in the audience have any questions for our panel? I have a question. I, I was, uh, uh, by, as a byproduct of a lot of this information, uh, back in 2013, it was discovered that I had a 2.3 centimeters uh, mass. Mm -hmm. uh, after visiting several physicians, uh, a biopsy was performed, it was negative. Mm -hmm. uh, the mass decreased, the following year increased. Mm -hmm. Another biopsy, what the biopsy was performed, and the results really were very doubtful in so far that anything did happen. And so and the only thing was suggested surgery, which I did not agree to a surgery where there was no diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Subsequently, I <coughs> went to see an oncologist who in turn suggested that I had uh, cancer, uh, additional tests were performed, bone marrow mm -hmm. test, every, te every possible test, everything turned out to be negative or maybe a, a very, very small portion. So the, after this happened, I went through a four weeks, a, a four treatments, infusion, uh, like uh, not, not the chemo treatment, but the infusion treatment and the results were zero, non effective At that point, I had to decide where do we go from here? I changed physician, I changed oncologist, and we started all over again. When we started all over again, all the tests were negative, and from, in essence, from 2013 to very recently, in November, we have gone up and down, up and down, up and down, the mass increasing from 2.3 centimeter to 7 point centimeter, and the last one is down to 4 point centimeters with no treatments whatsoever. Is there something that you can... We can try to comment on that. It might be a little bit hard since it's... Um it's like when we have a friend at Thanksgiving whose mom's friend has an issue and they kind of give us a few details here and there. It's always, you know, we actually have to see the medical records and then make that intelligent recommendation. But to maybe rephrase the question, um, you had a mass in the lungs of undetermined origin. 
Um, it sounds like they were worried for possible lymphoma, that's why they did a bone marrow biopsy. And they had a couple non-diagnostic uh, biopsies in the past. So you look well, so I'm not surprised that they're not too worried. Um, but at the same time, uh, the, diagno the diagnosis of lung cancer can sometimes be tricky. Um, getting tissue can sometimes be tricky. Um, and a surgical procedure, and I can let Dr. Chomia comment on this, or Dr. Seaman as well, um, a surgical procedure could sometimes be a diagnostic procedure where you don't actually have to take out the whole lobe of a lung, but maybe just part of it for a diagnosis, and depending on what they find in the operating room, then they proceed with further surgery if necessary. There's also the existence of different diagnostic modalities, like uh, not just a bronchoscopy, but a bronchoscopy of navigation. Um, that, yeah, that one's not too good. Which is a different thing, um, uh, and I can let one of these guys comment more on that. But it sounds to me like it's really a diagnostic dilemma, um, and, it, it, and it, it's probably not what we call a carcinoma or invasive cancer, but we could sometimes see things crop up that we don't understand that we don't necessarily put a finger on or a label on. I'll let these guys comment more on the newer diagnostic things. So yeah, the, the case that you're describing is terribly challenging because when you have a mass that comes and goes, comes and goes, and or a different diagnostic procedure that then performed with questionable results, where do you go? Sometimes there's a clear path. You know that one biopsy is negative, you do the next, or you do the next, or you do the next. But in your case, you know, over a period of five years, uh, something that's come and gone a little bit like that is a challenge. Um, traditional biopsies are, in many respects, becoming less and less frequent. Now we're using more advanced technology with navigation technology. Uh, in the near future, we're gonna be doing robotic bronchoscopies here, whereby we use not just a blended technology where we take a CAT scan and make a map of the lung, uh, but we also use um, specialized smaller equipment to help drive out into the lungs in these smaller areas where we previously we couldn't get. So in, in the future, not just direct tissue acquisition is gonna be also these blood-based markers whereby we order specialized blood tests that's going to help point us in different directions. Um, but I think that you know when we talk about doing bronchoscopies today or needle biopsies today, in five years we're going to be looking at a different landscape and different testing. But in your case is a challenging case. I mean our goal today is to talk about metastatic lung cancer. But when we see patients that have spots in their lungs, you have to also be concerned, could this be a very slow growing benign tumor in the lung? And those are rare. And they don't have the propensity to spread all over the body, but in due time, they will grow. Your body, regardless if you have a benign tumor or a malignant tumor, the immune system is gonna to try to fight this. If your immune system is a little bit depleted because of medication or age, you may not fight it as much. But it's not uncommon to see waxing and waning of a nodule of concern because of an underlying inflammatory reaction. This could also represent just a benign inflammatory scar, but what has to be undertaken is you need long-term surveillance. If you've decided you don't want that removed, Sometimes it's got to really keep tabs on that because scars can develop a cancer. We call that a scar carcinoma. When I first, I've been doing this for 25 years. I had one patient 15 years old monitored for a scar, which created a cancer. So just because you've chosen not to have it removed and you've had the test of time, doesn't 100% commit this, that this is benign or not evolving into a malignant cancer. Now, that being said, years ago, we would have a needle placed across the chest under x-ray guidance. The problem is up to 30% of the time, the lung could collapse when that happened. And depending on the size, sometimes one out of four, we may not have an answer. What Dr. Seaman alluded to with the navigation bronchoscopy, that allows us to take a patient turn them into a three-dimensional computer program and under a, almost like a GPS, like you have for your car or on your phone, we have a GPS for the lung and we can 
deliver a tiny little three millimeter tube anywhere in the lung, go into the mass and take multiple biopsies, our risk of collapse in the lung is very scant. That works sometimes 85 to 90 percent of the time. Part of this is because it's virtual. Well, Dr. Seaman also alluded to the concept of robotic bronchoscopy. This is a new technology where literally with a microscopic camera and a robot, we'll be able to drive a tiny tube anywhere in the lung, see the area of concern, and take multiple direct biopsies. This technology has just received FDA clearance in our country. It's been in place in South America and Europe for years. It's a proven technology. The company that has created this technology has chosen 10 programs in the country to start this. Cleveland Clinic, University of Pittsburgh, Duke University, Sarasota Memorial Healthcare. So in the next few months or so, you'll be seeing press releases on this. We are gonna be one of 10 programs in the country offering this ability to try to get better diagnostics of these nodules. So let's say we have a patient who's been biopsy, biopsy, we just don't have an answer, but it's getting bigger. The concern is, is there some kind of a cancer brewing there, benign or malignant? So surgical resection is appropriate. Sometimes we can remove a portion of the lung, we call that a wedge resection. Sometimes we have to remove an anatomical component or a lobectomy. Now, in years past, that required a big incision. You had aches and pains for three months. You were in the hospital for seven days. Nowadays, the majority of those procedures I perform using a robot system. It's four small puncture sites and maybe a little incision like this. For the patients who undergo a wedge resection, a small resection, the next morning, they go home. For the patients that we do a little back to beyond, on average, they go home two days after surgery. And my patients, at two weeks out, 60% of them don't even require pain medication anymore. So the robotic technology is a game changer. We have four robots here that we utilize for all our different types of surgical oncology. As we build our cancer hospital, we're gonna have additional robots available in there. So we'll be able to provide the services we do now and expand it for generations to come. Thank you. Does that answer your question, sir? So basically, you need to have continued surveillance and somebody needs to continue to watch, you know, what's going on. All right, well, so um, while Dr. Seaman has the uh, microphone, we talked a lot about the uh, bronchoscopy and, and sort of um, that's, that's a method for obtaining tissue. What other ways are there to obtain tissue for biopsy? So, so the decision to biopsy a nodule or mass on the lung um, is somewhat complex. It has to take into account the patient's factors, where the location of the lesion is, what the other anatomy around the lesion. So the decision to proceed with a bronchoscopy versus a needle biopsy where a radiologist would stick a needle between the ribs into the lung, uh, or perhaps even a different part of the biopsy is somewhat complex. Typically, when we're talking about lung cancer, it's either a bronchoscopy, a needle biopsy, or a surgical approach, uh, as Dr. Tony has alluded to earlier. What, so what kind of um, you know, uh, anesthesia or recovery time are required for either of those procedures? Yeah, so for uh, bronchoscopy, it's usually just a half a day uh, at the hospital. You come in in the morning, uh, nothing to eat or drink. Uh, we're hooked up the heart monitors and oxygen monitors while we do the testing. An hour to do the bronchoscopy. Uh, you're monitored for an hour, hour and a half afterwards, and then you go home that morning. Uh, needle biopsy is very similar. You come in in the morning, you have to eat or drink. Uh, the radiologist does a quick CAT scan to localize the nodule or the mass and stick the needle to the tear chest wall with it numb, with you uh, comfortable. And um, typically, you go home later that morning or early that afternoon after you're monitored uh, to make sure there were no complications. Surgery, as Dr. Chomiak alluded to, kind of depends city of the surgery, uh, generally it's at least a one day stay, maybe a little longer, uh, depending on the complexity. What are some potential complications for either of those procedures? So with uh, needle biopsies through the chest wall, the biggest complication risk is a collapse in the lung that's called an anthorax. Uh, if the lung exits kind of like a balloon and as you put the needle to it, it pops.
across the board. Uh, most of the time it's inconsequential. You monitor for two hours and get them home. Uh, but as many as 10 to the 20% of patients may have a pneumothorax and they have to stay in the hospital for a few days. Uh, with bronchoscopy, as Dr. Chomiak alluded to, uh, it's pretty uncommon. It's a less than 1%. Uh, and again, if the lung collapses, then you have to So just wanted to open up um, any questions from our audience, or if you have any questions, again, if you're watching um, our presentation today from Facebook, please feel free to submit your questions. We've got a panel of experts right here in front of you, and they're re ready to answer any of your questions. So is there anybody that has a question at this time in our audience? I have a question. I'm looking at the topic here, and it says lung cancer, recent events, and future opportunities. What about those? There's a lot um, kind of in the works. So right now, kind of the biggest two areas that have been built kind of in the immunotherapies and the targeted therapies that we talked about before. Right. Um, but on top of that, there's newer agents. So whenever in oncology we're talking about what's next, then we kind of go to what we say is earlier phase clinical trials. So right now there's a lot of these immunotherapies that are coming out, um, especially the checkpoint inhibitors, which is usually what most people get exposed to at some point. Um, but in the future, there's gonna be even more <coughs> development in that technology in a couple of different ways. One is gonna be genetically modified T cells, something called CAR T cells. These are already in development for certain types of blood cancers. Um, these are available in certain centers for types of lymphomas that have been kind of uh, refractory to treatment. That's probably gonna be moving into the solid tumor area in the next several years, uh, but that'll probably be around. Um, there's another technology called CRISPR technology. So CRISPR helps you genetic, you can edit the genome in a way that um, no one ever expected to be able to. And you can make these basically side effect profiles a lot safer to give. I don't think that's gonna be something that's available for non-small cell lung cancer for years to come, but I do think that's probably gonna come down some point. It's available in clinical trials in certain areas of the country, but not right now, that's true. Um, so other areas of immunotherapy that are being developed are when we're giving the checkpoint inhibitors in addition with another drug. And those again are early phase trials, so those aren't being, they're not on the market. Whenever we're studying a new therapy, it kind of has to go through a certain rhythm or a certain developmental process. We start with early phase clinical trials that figure out the safety profile of whatever the drug under investigation is. And you go into the second phase clinical trial, we're trying to get a signal of response. And then a third phase, we're actually trying to see if this stuff is better or it's already being used. Um, it's a very difficult, costly, uh, long-term process. It takes a long time to figure out. But in development right now are drugs that are trying to synergistic with the current checkpoint inhibitors. So we have some of those trials in our drug development unit as well, where they're giving these in combination with a checkpoint in order to see if that augments its response. But we don't know the answer to that. That's why it's in trial. Um, so those would be the two kind of areas right now in lung cancer. The other thing I'd mention is that the better we understand the biology of the disease, the better we understand how to treat it. And every year, there's always a couple new mutations that get put on the canon of actionable mutations that we didn't know about before. So in the past year, there's one that was ERAF, that's usually seen in melanoma, so that we know that works well in lung cancer. There's something called HER2, we know that worked in breast cancer before, and it turns out that works in lung cancer as well. And then there's new one called TRK, or TREK, and I just saw an advertisement for this in one of the medical journals I read, and I thought, wow, that's crazy, because that's 0.1% of all patients with metastatic. So, the understanding of the biology as time goes on will also be really important. Dr. Kohler, what would you suggest for somebody if they want to participate in a clinical trial, even if it's an earlier stage, stage one, you know, early, earlier trial, for people to get active and, and be able to participate in one? Yeah, clinical trials are really important for what we do as medical oncologists um, because it's how we develop new therapies and new drugs. Um, 
we're really active in looking at all phases of development, phase one through phase three um, in our clinics. Right now, I'd say for the most part, if people are doing well, uh, we don't usually shake or kind of rattle the boat too much. We kind of like to let things be when things are going well. Uh, but sometimes we don't have a choice and we'll find something and we might have an actual mutation that we have a drug for that's being studied. Um, and so the way we work locally is all phase two and phase three trials, we enroll in our clinics um, and there's a couple clinics in town and we all kind of can manage that. If it's an earlier phase trial though, so like a phase one trial, then there's our drug development unit kind of on the east side of town. Um, and that's different because in a phase one trial, they want to do pharmacokinetic uh, studies, they have to do frequent lab draws. It's a different animal altogether. Um, and a lot of those, if you look at what's available in our phase one venue, there's like literally no chemotherapy trials anymore. Right, so to kind of get to your question a little bit, because I don't know the answer, just if you predict in the future a little bit, but what's the future of managing like metastatic on small cell lung cancer three years from now, five years from now? Well, chemotherapy is not really the answer, right? We can say that it's probably plays a role, and it probably will say play a role, at least through our adult lifehood, but I don't think that that's what people are excited about anymore. Uh, there's a lot more looking into kind of various types of immunotherapies and targeted therapies still there. Somebody should just talk to their oncologist about a trial. And if anybody, yeah, if you're ever interested, so clinical trials can be tricky. Um, we, we do address it whenever we have one that's open, but if you're ever interested, always ask, hey, um, I'm interested in the clinical trial. Anything you have available here? If not, is there anything available anywhere else? Right, so the biggest cancer center to Sarasota, that's called an, an NCCS, and it would be Moffitt. You can always ask for a second opinion there as well to see if they had anything available. And that's typically what we do for our patients in clinic. Um, trials can be tricky though, you need to be close to wherever you're doing that trial because it's going to require frequent labs, you're going to have to have a certain health status. Um, sometimes it's difficult to enroll in trials for various reasons. Um, it could be as simple as someone's magnesium level or something silly like this. Um, but um, in general, there are many trials out there. Uh, you just ask if you're curious about it. So while you have your yeah, add in from, from the radiation standpoint, what Dr. Fuller had alluded to before. There are some ongoing uh, trials that are phase three that are looking at, in addition, adding in radiation for people who have limited metastatic disease, just a few sites. The definition of that varies amongst universities from one site even up to five sites, and I think one area, or one university is up to eight sites where with this newer technology that we're using, the stereotactic iodine therapy, which is giving very high doses and five or less treatments, the side effects are practically nothing depending upon the site, as opposed to how the more standard radiation works, and attacking the areas beyond the lung with this technology, and then even coming back later and treating mass in the lung with some radiation to a more standard approach. Right now, those trials are ongoing, but as far as the future, for a number of different cancers, the trials um, that are coming out that are the phase one and phase two are positive, and in cancers such as melanoma with immunotherapies, there's actually uh, something called the scopal effect where the radiation in a single high treatment to an area that's spread such as the brain has been shown to rev up the um, immune system even more, and uh, by giving that radiation, it makes the immunotherapy work better than if that radiation wasn't given. So, uh, you know, whether we see this in other cancers and depending upon uh, how things play out, uh, imaging now has improved so much that when we do certain imaging, we can really tell as best as possible, it's not perfect, that things could maybe more, be more limited metastatic disease as opposed to extensive metastatic disease as opposed to in the past where MRIs, quality wasn't as good, PET scans are improving, different imaging, different imaging is really helping us along with this too, and the advent of the immunotherapy uh, drugs and, and targeted agents is a, kind of a breakthrough. I'll add one thing. Is that available now, or is that just in on, it's really reserved for trials. It's not ready for prime time at this point. It's still um, on a trial. 
Yeah, the only other thing I'd add to kind of follow up to is I, I sent it a hint of, you know, kind of um, nihilism almost, or just kind of tiredness with, with what is available. Um, and so we do have to have humility with this disease. It's age four, it is a difficult kind of disease to manage. I mean, we've seen unprecedented results with what we have now available, and it's changed remarkably, even in the past three years. Um, but still, there is a place for being humble for that disease, you know, even though, because I can't tell you that tomorrow it's going to be cured. Thanks. I also want to segue a little bit on advancements. Um, I have tremendous interest and experience in sort of the processes of lung cancer management. I mean, currently in our country, for the majority of our country, if you are diagnosed with a spot on your lung, by the time you've had the opportunity to get all the testing, the biopsies, see every specialist, to the first implementation of your treatment plan, be that surgical, be that observation, be that chemotherapy or radiation, that time lag is about 90 days. And that's sort of standard of care in the United States. One of the visions we have is to get to the point and it'll be much easier once we have our cancer hospital to have a multidisciplinary experience. Imagine that person who's identified with a spot, not only accidentally, but the folks that we actually screen for to find these spots. That person bypasses all those customary processes, enters through a lung cancer navigator into a multidisciplinary format where you're met real time with all the specialists, the folks you need, and a treatment plan is generated, and you're provided a list of homework. You're gonna get this on this date, this on that date, this on this date, could have surgery on this day. And it's all done real time. And it can be. I've been involved in two other programs where we reduced that from 90 days to less than two weeks. That is our goal here. So let me tell you what we've accomplished right now virtually, because we don't have our building yet, but it's coming down the pipeline. So virtually, we are blessed to have two lung cancer navigators who help as point guards to coordinate all that. What you've seen here today, this is the multidisciplinary approach of lung cancer management. We do this every week. Every newly diagnosed lung cancer is reviewed on a weekly basis in our group, as well as the abnormal scans through our lung cancer scanning program. And we, as a group, it's actually about 25 people, put together a treatment plan recommendations and try to get that patient to the right people as quickly as possible. Now, the big vision is once we have our cancer hospital and our multidisciplinary clinics, we're gonna be able to manage real time breast cancer, neurologic cancer, genitourinary cancer, gastrointestinal cancer, lung cancer, and any other major cancers. So those patients will come in and right there have a treatment plan record. So that's one of the key advancements we're working on here in our program. We have it now virtually. Soon we'll have it real time. Thanks. Um, so I guess go back to um, Dr. Kohler for a minute. And you're talking about your different you know, therapies that you offer of your patients. Um, can you talk a little bit about side effects and sort of how people feel while they're on those treatments and do they differ from, from treatment to treatment? Yeah, side effects versus immature therapy differ remarkably uh, depending on what we use. So for, to start with the easiest, um, the newer immunotherapies in general are pretty well tolerated actually. There's only about two to three percent of people who ever have to discontinue those drugs because of side effects. Um, we generally say that any sort of itis, that means that an inflammatory process someplace in the body that can happen, um, that's, that's the main side effects that we see as rate limiting steps for immunotherapy. So for example, it might, it might inflame the immune system and affect the thyroid, so you get thyroiditis, or the lung tissue, you get pneumonitis, or the colon, you get colitis, or the liver, you get hepatitis. Sometimes you can see a rash. But for the most part, they're actually pretty well tolerated. Um, not a lot of people have to come off those drugs. Um, sometimes people feel kind of tired and fluid for the first couple months, but after that, they actually feel relatively well. Chemotherapy is what everybody fears. Um, so chemotherapy is the one that can make people feel kind of tired, maybe a little bit groggy. For the most part nowadays, we have a pretty good handle on controlling nausea 
from all of our newer anti-nausea medications, so that doesn't tend to be as much of an issue, which in the past that tended to be a very big issue. Um, in my experience, most people feel kind of just tired, usually three to five days after they get the chemotherapy, and then that is a cumulative side effect, meaning it adds over time. So you can really only do that for so long. We do have some that we use in a maintenance strategy, so kind of a lower dose at a drug that's more tolerable that someone can take on long term. But for the most part, the chemotherapy is the one that people fear the most simply because of that. Um, kind of gotten away from a lot of the regimens where you lose your hair, uh, but you still can lose your hair with one of the newer drugs we use. Um, and as far as the target therapies, these are sort of a miracle in a lot of ways because most of these newer drugs, it's like taking an, an aspirin once a day. Um, so for example, I had a patient the other day, never smoked, we sent that blood test that looks for molecular genetics and she had one of these canonical EGFR mutations. We put her on the newer drug that was just approved called Tegresso. Um, and she was kind of shocked. She hasn't felt any problems from this drug yet. And so, as this gets back to, as we understand the biology of the disease better with time, and drugs are more specific to what they're targeting, then there's less side effects. So targeted therapy is very specific, uh, but traditionally that you should also target healthy versions of those genes, so people can have like rashes and things like this. But that just doesn't happen as much anymore, so the side effects fortunately are improved. Um, is it a myth that uh, with any of the the worse the rash is, the better the treatment is working? Yes, that's an absolute myth. Yeah. I love talking about myths, so I'd love more <laughs> talk more about that. So uh, that is true with what we call EGFR inhibitors. So um, there is uh, these drugs that aren't used as much for metastatic colon cancer in particular. Uh, because again, as we understood that disease more and more, there's these things called RAS or RAS mutations that come up, and then people do not respond to EGFR inhibitors. So people kind of got kind of away from using those drugs. But these are drugs where um, there are monoclonal antibodies, so there are infusions, there are proteins, um, and we knew, uh, based on research, that the, the greater degree of rash someone's getting from these drugs, the more likely they would respond. So people sort of hope to have a rash to cause a lot of anxiety. Um, but the field general kind of like those drugs. Okay. Thank you. So kind of the same question for Dr. Solomon. Um, what are some of the common side effects with radiation treatment? So radiation side effects are broken into two categories. Generally, there's what we call the early effects. These are the ones that happen during the course of the radiation are all temporary. And then the late effects, which may not even set in until six months to a couple of years later, but they're fairly rare. And depending upon the body site that's being treated, because radiation is a localized treatment, the side effects are really due to the surrounding structures in that area. So when it comes to lung cancer, when we do a more traditional type of radiation for the more advanced cancers and we're treating the lung mass plus and lymph nodes, the side effects during a six week course, sending them usually about halfway through, may include fatigue, being a little more tired at the end of the day is the typical scenario. Maybe a dry cough uh, and potentially feeling of uh, food sticking in the esophagus around the area of the lymph nodes, maybe some heartburn. If we're talking about a stereotactic body approach where we're just treating a stage one, a solitary lung mass nodule, then 90% of the time there's literally no side effects. About 10% of the time there could be some fatigue, maybe some night sweats or fevers at night. Uh, that is about 10%. And these things are temporary. Getting into the late effects, the late effects are ones that uh, are pretty rare usually. We keep them for less than 5%. And there's guidelines that have been established over the years that have looked at what doses each normal organ can tolerate, what percentage of the normal organ do we have to keep the radiation doses below. So if you adhere to the guidelines, then the risks are typically anywhere from 5% down to, in some cases, uh, less than 0.2%. And uh, we definitely don't want late effects, late effects are a more permanent type of side effect that can be difficult to deal with. The, the, the biggest issue when it comes to lung cancer is a kind of what we call a subacute effect, which can happen less than six months, but usually a couple weeks after. It's called radiation pneumonitis. It's this inflammatory response where uh, there are changes on imaging, but also the patient could have fatigue, could have a dry cough, fevers at night, some shortness of breath and guidelines have evolved over the time of 
what to um, keep different parts loyal to with the different technology. So uh, again, yeah. we usually uh, try to keep that risk to less than five percent. But there's treatments for short-term side effects and long-term side effects if they need. Right. What are those um, treatments? So for uh, radiation pneumonitis, which thankfully we are seeing less and less of with the new guidelines of what to keep the normal structures do. Uh, sometimes steroids are used, sometimes we have to use oxygen. So one, I have one other question for Dr. Toniak. Um, since we have so many advancements in robotic surgeries, why would we ever do an open procedure versus a robotic procedure? Well, the open procedure, and there's even a couple different ways that the open procedure can be performed through smaller incisions, trying to spare some of the muscles that control your shoulder blade versus traditionally cutting them. The robotic platform is sort of our entry of choice. We like to try to offer that to every single patient, but here's, I shared with you the advantages of robotic surgery to the patient. Much less downtime, much less aches and pains, quicker return to quality of life. But from a surgeon's perspective, that operation is actually more technically challenging and it takes longer. I've been doing this for, I guess I could say, a quarter of a century now. And part of what I utilize is my six degrees of freedom of my hand and the ability to touch. So if a patient has a variant of anatomy or scar tissue from a prior operation or scar tissue from a pleurisy where I can't visualize the blood vessels or the airway or the vein coming off the heart that has to be disconnected, I have to use my finger the robot, under current technology, does not have touch. We call that haptic feedback. So it's a visual operation. So when I tell patients we're offering the robot, we go ahead and go forward with that. But if I get to the point where safely we just can't complete the operation, then it's okay to proceed with what I do is called the vertical thoracotomy. It's only a four inch incision, not these old barbaric incisions that were done decades ago. And with that, I have the ability to use my hands to feel things that I may not be able to see. Now also, we may have patients that come in with large tumors. And in those situations, we would proceed with an open procedure because when I place eight, or excuse me, four eight millimeter puncture sites on the patient, and perhaps a, a two inch accessory incision. Sometimes I have to tell the patient, we can't remove this out of an eight millimeter hole. So in situations where we have a very large tumor, or we have a tumor that is near the heart, where I know I'm not gonna be able to safely separate all the critical anatomy without the sense of touch. In those cases, we would do an open procedure. And there's nothing wrong with that. So it's tailored to the patient. Thank you. So again, I want to open it up to the audience. Does anybody here have any questions, any burning questions for our um, expert panel here? Or if you are um, you know, watching from Facebook, please feel free to submit your questions to us. Um, and those questions answered for you. Anybody here have a question for our panel? Any Facebook questions? We do have one. If you, if someone is a non-smoker, never smoker even, but they're concerned about the risk of lung cancer, how do you go about the screening process to start that? Yeah, so that's that's a question that comes up quite a bit, um, particularly in individuals who may have a rich family history, multiple family members who have lung cancer. Uh, oftentimes, that's a discussion that they need to have with their provider. Care provider, um, or if they want to seek out you know, consultation to discuss that, because there is the possibility with a lung cancer screening CT that a nodule or a mass may be found, uh, but that comes at a cost of some radiation exposure. Uh, we're very fortunate now um, that most CAT scans are done with dose reduction techniques, so the dose of the radiation is less, uh, but it is something that you have to really discuss with the patient so they understand there's risk. That being said, I counsel many patients and many of their concerns are substantial and uh, oftentimes we move forward with the low dose CAT scan screening technology. Um, it's a discussion you have to have and you have to kind of map out also where you go from there. If the CAT scan is negative today, that doesn't mean in five years your risk profile changes. In fact, you have the same 
Chris Brokaw and have had that discussion again. Um, the background of that is also more complex because insurance companies may not pay for that month of cancer screening study if you don't have the risk factors that they uh, acknowledge. Um, most programs like ours have a, a cash rate that the patients can uh, pay. Um, just because we feel like that the, it's an important need that we offer the, the community because um, we also have a lot of patients that don't have insurance. So, Amy, what's our... So, the self-pay price for our low-dose CT scan for lung cancer screening is $150 for the actual CAT scan, and it's a $50 radiology interpretation fee, so it's a total of $200. And those are for those patients that really don't fit those eligibility criteria guidelines, and those are basically you have to be between ages of 55 and 77. You have to be a current smoker or someone who has quit within the last 15 years, and we have smoked about half a day for 30 years or more. So that's really what insurance companies or Medicare CMS really look at when they're looking at eligibility and paying, reimbursing for, the, for that service. So if you don't fit that criteria, it doesn't mean you can't have a CAT scan done, a low-dose CAT scan, but it does mean that you'll likely have to self-pay for it out of pocket, and we do offer that. So um, there's certainly family histories that we take that there's an unusual richness of cancer. Um, and you have family members that have colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, thyroid cancer. Uh, and I think a lot of our limitations are is we have such an infantile understanding of how cancer is transmitted and all of the risk. Um, we know that many molecular genetic abnormalities pose a risk for cancer. I think it's more that we take that history and we take that into account when we're giving recommendations. The National Cancer Center Network actually recognizes that as one of the risk factors for cancer, and they have different recommendations than other professional societies based on cancer. Well, it's a, it's a really, really interesting yeah. question. Um, so uh, I would just echo what Dr. Seaman said. Um, so there's a lot of mutations that we do know right now that are inheritable. We call them germline mutations, meaning that you got a copy from mom or dad. So you got, and the, the most common one you'll hear about in the news is something called BRCA, B-R-C-A. Um, for, yeah, and that puts you at increased risk for breast cancer, ovarian cancer, uh, but also pancreatic cancer, um, and some other cancer, prostate cancer included. Uh, it's a lot, it's a lot of body dumps. No, so, we, so lung cancer, we just don't know. Um, it doesn't turn to be, it's not these germline mutations that seem to be the same kind of risk factor. It seems that for whatever reason, some people are more likely to develop these other mutations that then drive these diseases, even if they've never had a history of smoking. So we're still learning about this and understanding this, um, and we certainly see family histories where disease clusters, even if, like, say, you had five or six family members with lung cancer, that's unusual, even if everyone did smoke. So there's probably just something there we just don't know. Right. Mm -hmm. Because nobody in my whole family has nobody. Yeah, and cancer is getting more and more common. It's more and more prevalent every year. Uh, it's also getting uh, this very frightening trend is that for most diseases, um, we're seeing younger and younger people get cancers as well. So we don't know why. Have any other um, Facebook questions? We do not. Okay. Any other questions here from our audience? Any closing remarks? I think that we're about done with time. But if anybody would like to make a closing remark, I'd be happy to hear it. I would just say thanks for everybody for coming. I think lung cancer does get enough support from the community. There's certain cancers out there that get a lot of support. Uh, certain other diseases that get a lot of support. Lung cancer is not one of them. Um, so I appreciate everybody coming. Yeah, thank you for everybody supporting it, not only here, but also on Facebook. Thank you for all the likes and shares. Uh, and one closing you know, comment I'd like to make is it takes a real team to be able to help care for lung cancer patients. And it's not just the doctors and the surgeons, it's not just the nurses, but it's also the, the physical therapists, the nutritional specialists, the case managers, the social workers, uh, and it's also the family members. You know, there's tremendous support and love that's given by family members. So uh, they also need support. And 
comprehensive cancer centers like we're building and like we have, you know, have access to information that we can share and help support those family members as well as uh, provide you all access with social workers and nutrition specialists and so forth. So uh, by all means, reach out to us for more information and or uh, other society online. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great afternoon.